Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. Jay Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, Jay Warner Wallace. Thanks for joining us at Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Uh, we've been in the middle of a series. If you have not been part of our uh, audience over the last several weeks, a couple of months, we are in season five of Cold Case Christianity, and we are talking about quick shot responses. These are the brief, rhetorically powerful responses, at least we hope that's the case, to the most common objections that are offered about Christianity. And uh, our hope here is to equip you in a way that will help you to not only defend what you believe, but to have powerful conversations with people who are questioning, uh, people who are seeking God. Look, in the end, we have a tendency to think that all we're here to do is to defend ourselves, right, from people who have objections or to defend God's nature or God's honor. I'm sure that's part of what we do. But what we really are here to do is to make disciples, is to lead people to Christ. And there are many of us who have built a wall between ourselves and the gospel that we have constructed with our own objections. And some of these are great objections. Some of these are true places where we struggle. And we might struggle in these uh, questions because we had a certain way of, of being raised or we had a certain experience as a child or we just have thought about seriously some of these questions for a long time. And we have honest, heartfelt, rational objections to the Christian worldview. And I think what we want to do is that we know, and I agree with you, anyone who would say that, look, no one uh, has ever been argued into the kingdom. I hear that statement constantly. Of course, no one comes to Jesus until God first draws them. But once God has drawn you in some way, what does that even mean? Well, for me, I can tell you what it meant. It meant that God removed the hostility I had toward God, that God allowed me to stop being such a jerk about the issues and to just listen for a minute. And I was never willing to listen before that, never willing to seriously consider the claims of Christianity, and suddenly I was. And then the claims were presented to me. I think most of us would agree that God does something first, and then He uses us for whatever reason. He allows us to preach the gospel, to share the gospel. I think God has the power to bring us all the way from no understanding of the gospel to complete understanding without anyone else having to share it with us. God is that powerful. He could do that. But for some reason, He allows us to be part of the process to share the gospel. Why? He doesn't have to. He could just snap His fingers. We could all be Christians, all be believers from the very beginning. Instead, He allows somebody to share something that is persuasive. Something that actually makes sense given the fact that God has done something in us first. The only question is, what is it you're sharing? Now, I, I would suggest that one of the things you can share, of course, you need to have a clear understanding of what the gospel, what is the offer that God makes through Christ on the cross. But also, we want to be able to offer it in a way that is reasonable and evidential because we're in a culture, and by the way, this is completely consistent with first century Christians who worked and operated as direct evidence, eyewitnesses. They made these claims as eyewitnesses. And they were chosen to make these claims as eyewitnesses. That's how you became an apostle. That's how Matthias took over for Judas. He happened to be somebody who qualified because he was there from the baptism to the resurrection. Acts 2. Acts 1. So I, I think what we want to be able to do is take a similar approach evidentially. And that's why we take time to do this. Because doing this is part of what we do to share the gospel. Doing this is what we do because we love people enough to not want to see them perish. It is not us counterpunching. That's not what we're doing here. It's us sharing truth, the gospel. And sometimes you're going to need to do that by way of dismantling the barriers that people have built between themselves and the gospel. That's what we're doing. Okay, that being said, we want to be able to offer some resources on our website, all of which are free. At Cold Case Christianity, you will see that every single page is downloadable 
and you can keep it as a PDF file without any of the sidebar stuff, without any of the header stuff, just as the article you could assemble. You could assemble an entire notebook of material from our website because it's built to do that. Everything is built to download. All of our Bible inserts on the home page on the right hand side, you'll see all those free Bible inserts. Yeah, we write books. We do. Because the deepest way I can help you to make a case for what you believe is in the, in the um, uh, course of writing a book. And so you'll see we've written a trilogy of books that will help you become a good case maker. But that is not why we exist to sell you something. I'm not interested in selling you something. I'm interested in you joining me in a larger mission that really requires us to be prepared to make the case for why Christianity is true. And if you can become that kind of Christian, the Christian case maker, not just the Christian, but the Christian case maker, you'll have the ability, number one, you will have such confidence that you will not act like a Chihuahua. You'll act like a Great Dane. What I mean is, you know that Chihuahuas make a lot of noise because they're not quite sure if they can hang on. They're not quite sure they can even defend themselves. They are worried about their defense. They need to sound bigger than they are, so they bark a lot. They make a lot of noise. In a dog yard, Chihuahua is the noisiest dog, but you know, Great Danes don't make any noise. Why? Why would I need to? I already know I'm the biggest dog. Well, if Christianity is true, you happen to possess the one true view of the world. If you're confident that it's true, you will not sound like a chihuahua. But if you're not quite sure, get ready. It's fight or flight. You're liable to sound defensive. We need to know why it's true, even to display the character of Christ to the world around us. That being said, this week we're going to talk about an objection that is often leveled by a a world that really denies the exclusivity of Christianity, feels as though that that is um, intolerant and repulsive, that really, if there is a God, He would love us enough to accept us as we are, if at least we are sincere. So that's the objection they'll offer. And here it is. All God expects of us is sincerity. Sincerity. That's it. You have to believe certain things about Jesus and certain doctrinal truths. You're crazy. All If there is a God, all that God would care about is our sincerity. Now, I hear this objection quite a bit. This is why I've assembled what I believe are the top 25 objections to Christianity, and we're going through those on our show. And the reason why I, I'm slowly working through, and I think you could, you could pick 50, you could pick 100 if you wanted to, but I'm trying to pick the ones that I see that young people especially are most likely to be influenced by. And when we're in a culture that doesn't think anything's objectively true, and actually says it's kind of arrogant if you think something is objectively true, it's really about my, my perspective, my story, my personal experience. That might be true for you, but it's not true for me. As long as I'm sincere, whatever I believe will be honored by God if there in fact is a God. And if there isn't, at least I'm sincere for my entire life. That's a win-win. Do you see the kind of objection this is? Well, although this is not a, a direct claim against the reliability of Scripture, it's not a, a direct assault against any of the claims of Christianity, you can see how this kind of claim would undermine the entire evangelism project, right? Because if all you need is sincerity, why do I need you to agree with me on anything, agree with Jesus on anything, agree with God on anything? So that's why we're going to actually respond to the objection two different ways that will help you build a robust, cumulative response. Okay, I'll take a break. When we come back, I'll give you the first way to respond to the claim that all God cares about is our sincerity. Welcome to the One Minute Apologist. One Minute Apologist. We interview the world's leading apologists to provide credible answers to curious questions. So tell us, why are you a Christian? Well, you know, I even ask that question of lots of audiences I talk to around the country. And the typical answers I get are, are well, I was raised in the church. I was, I have had an experience of God. I, I pray and God I seems to answer my prayers. I've had things happen in my life that I can only be explained by God's existence. Or I've had a transformational experience. And I think those are all really good answers. Because I never went on to deny the evidence of experience. But I gotta tell you, I was raised in a family. I have six brothers and sisters from my half brothers and sisters who are all Mormons. And those answers happen to be their answers too. Now, most of us as Christians would say, well, Mormonism is false. It's demonstrably false. 
So if whatever answer we're giving as Christians is exactly the same as a Mormon would give, we might want to reconsider how it is we're coming to our decisions to begin with. I'm not a Christian because it works for me. I'm not a Christian because I've had uh, really any transformational experience of, of that nature. I'm not a Christian because I was trying to solve a problem or because I was raised in a Christian home because I wasn't. I'm a Christian because it's true <laughs> and I'm stuck with it and it doesn't work for me. I mean, a lot of times it's, it's the most inconvenient thing to be is to be a Christian, right? You have to make hard choices, deny yourself, do the right thing instead of the thing that feels good. But it's far better, it seems to me, to live in the truth than in a lie. So that's why I'm a Christian, because it's true. Connect with Cold Case Christianity on social media. Visit the Cold Case Christianity homepage and click the social media icons on the top right toolbar. Jim is active on Facebook and Twitter, posting the best apologetics articles from over 250 Christian blogs around the country. You'll also find links to Jim's Instagram, Pinterest, and Google Plus accounts, along with a link to the Cold Case Christianity YouTube page. Stay connected with with Cold Case Christianity and become a better Christian case maker. Okay, so we're going to try to respond to this, uh, this claim a little bit. And, and, and this is a claim that because it, it's kind of oblique, the way it comes at the Christian worldview, that I almost feel like we need a kind of a more subtle, nuanced way to respond to this. But uh, so there are always challenges, right? And the challenge you have when you're trying to give a brief response is brevity. Because anytime you're trying to be brief, you, you are going to sacrifice something in terms of the depth of knowledge needed to really get your hands around something. Anytime you're trying to be persuasive, especially quickly, you're probably going to sacrifice some precision. Because in order to be more nuanced and to dig out the fuller meaning of terms and all of this, it's going to take more words. But if what we're trying to do here is to be brief first and foremost, because we're in a culture where the time span, for example, of millennials was short to begin with. I'm not a millennial, okay? I'm not saying that as a criticism of millennials, but we have seen that the time span of Gen Z is even shorter. And you know this, why do you think that the, ch the Snapchat videos are so short or Instagram stories are only limited to a certain amount of time or a video on Instagram is limited to a minute right now? Or why do you think that the, the ad will run for five seconds and then it, Look, we have shortened our attention span. And, and it is so short, in fact, that it, it, it causes us to have to rethink how we, we make claims and how we respond to claims. I don't know if you notice this or not, but if you look at a movie from, say, the 1930s and you have two people in a dialogue, you will have the camera stay on one person, she finishes her whole sentence. Then the other person talks back to her and the camera's on that person and he finishes his entire sentence. That is not the way we shoot dialogues anymore, right? We shoot her starting to talk, she's three seconds in, now we're over her shoulder looking at him, now we're backed up from the whole view of the both people talking, and now we got a view in the background, his expression and her. We break this thing up into three to five second turns. Why? Because we have a short tension span. And we're just making it worse by doing that to begin with. But that means for you and I trying to master responses to the most popular objections to Christianity, we're going to have to learn how to be rhetorically powerful, persuasive, and brief. So how do you do that? Well, we try to do quick shots. And that means that sometimes you're going to feel like, well, I wish I could say that a little better or with a little more precision. I get it. But we're trying to be brief. So let's take a look at the first response we might offer to the idea that all God cares about is our sincerity. I'll put it on the screen for you so you can follow along with the words. Okay, well, why would you believe that? I mean, why would you believe that God expects nothing more than sincerity? I mean, it sounds like, and maybe I'm misinterpreting you, but it sounds like you actually know the mind of God on the issue about what He expects, right? I mean, otherwise, how would you know that this is what God desires? Did He reveal that to you personally, or... Did you learn that in a holy book, some, some piece of scripture? I mean, is that can you show me where you got that notion? Because the Christian holy book, the Bible, is clear on this issue. God values, according to the Christian scriptures, truth over sincerity. Because it's possible to be sincere, yet sincerely wrong. 
Jesus, when he was describing religious people who were sincere, right? They were sincere, but he, he said they were misguided. He said it this way, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure that, that Jesus was talking about people who sincerely believe that, who sincerely place their trust in those human rules. But Jesus said they were sincerely wrong. I think it's pretty clear that, at least from the scripture that I'm reading, that God values truth over human rules and responses, even the response of sincerity. So, so unless you have some, if you're going to point to me where it is you think you know that God has said to you, or to any of us, that all He cares about is sincerity, I think we're in a place where, you know, look, if you're truly interested in what God expects from us, you know, we we got to look at a, a place where we think God has spoken. Have you considered the words of Jesus on this issue? Now, the reason why we're coming at this from the perspective of, well, how would you know? And I think we have to be really careful not to have this sound like we are being um, flippant or you can't know that. You'd have to know the mind of God to know that. Uh, listen, I have heard some of us um, either say that verbally that way in a very aggressive way or have typed it on social media in such a way that it's certainly, I'm reading it that way. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. But the point is we don't want to be flippant about it. We're simply saying, okay, great. You're saying that all God thinks is X or all God cares about is X or all God desires is X. Well, it sounds like you know what God thinks, cares about, and desires. How would, how would any of us really know that? Now, I could see if you thought, well, no, I, I, I adhere to a certain religious view, a certain spiritual uh, tradition in which our scripture says that God says this. Then fine, show me that. Then we can talk about whether or not the, the scripture of one religious worldview is as valid or reliable as the scripture of another. But to say this about anything about God like this, it really assumes that you know what God is thinking. And that would be, I think, rather elusive, wouldn't it? Just to be fair. Now, I think as a Christian, I'm going to tell you what I think God says because I have a source I can go back to called the New Testament. And so I can look at I can show you at least from a Christian perspective. But we're going to go into another response for this, okay, which will be a little less uh, based in Scripture like this. But the point is, I think we would have to at least agree that to say you know something about the mind of God would require you to know, to have a source that you could go back to, that you could say, this is why I think God thinks that. So that's the first way I would respond. You know, sometimes when I write the quick shots, and I'm, I, and I'm basing this on either how I've been responding to this in university settings where these questions get asked, or I think about how I've responded to this in my conversations with people I care about. When I look at this, I think, well, would I go here first? <laughs> you know, would I really go to that response first? Or maybe I should. So, so as you read through our quick shots, I want you to, to know that I'm not putting these in order of priority. Like, this is my favorite. This is my second favorite. I'm really doing it in, in you might find the number two is your best way in. Um, and that's why I give you two. So if the first one is not resonating with you or with the person you're talking to, you can go to the next response. So let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll go to that next response and talk about another way that you could respond to the claim that all God cares about is your sincerity. I often get asked this question having worked a lot of criminal trials and having worked a lot with eyewitnesses on the stand as parts of larger investigations. How can you trust the eyewitness accounts we call the Gospels if eyewitness testimony is so utterly unreliable to begin with? Well, okay, there's some dispute about whether or not eyewitness uh, testimony is unreliable, but let's just for the sake of argument, I'll just tell you, I don't really ever trust eyewitnesses. And I often say this, I don't want to get burned by an eyewitness uh, on, the, on the stand in a jury trial. That's the last place you want to first discover that your eyewitness has been lying to you. And many of my cases ended up on Dateline, so I certainly don't want to go on national television and find out that a witness is lying. And it can happen. So I just learned over the years, I don't trust. If you told me I can't trust an eyewitness, I'm like, yeah, no kidding. I don't trust eyewitnesses. I will never, ever start off trusting an eyewitness. Let me tell you what I do instead. I test eyewitnesses. We have a test. 
a test that we run in every criminal trial. It's in the jury instructions for jurors to assess eyewitnesses. Were they really there to see what they said they saw? Can they be corroborated or verified in some way? Have they changed their story over time? And finally, do they possess a bias that would cause them to lie? Now, after you have tested an eyewitness, if they pass the test, sorry, you're gonna be instructed by the judge to trust them. Oh, I don't know. You know, he reminds me of my Uncle Phil, and my Uncle Phil's a liar. I can't trust this guy. He reminds me of Phil. Really? Did you test him? Well, yeah. Did he pass the test? Well, yeah. Then I'm sorry. I don't care if you don't like the way he looks. You have to trust him as an eyewitness because he passed the test. And I will tell you that as I looked at the Gospels, I was not trying, I didn't want to be a Christian, but they passed the test. And then I was stuck. If I'm gonna be honest, a judge would have instructed me to trust what's being said because they passed the test. So now you know, these are the four ways that you're gonna test an eyewitness. Were they really there to see what they said they saw? Can they be corroborated or verified in some way? Have they changed their story over time? And finally, do they possess a bias that would cause them to lie? Apply that test for yourself to the Gospels. You'll see that they passed the test. In addition to Jim's daily blog and weekly podcasts and videos, Jim continues to write books designed to help you become a better Christian casemaker. At coldcasechristianity.com, you'll find a link to Cold Case Christianity, God's Crime Scene, Forensic Faith, and Alive. These resources will help you defend what you believe and share it with others. And if you want to help your kids become Christian case makers, be sure to check out the kids' versions of Jay Warner's books. Okay, in our first response, we were really talking about um, from a biblical perspective or from a scripture perspective, right? This is the idea that uh, if you're going to make a claim about God, you'd have to have some text or revelation of God to know what God is thinking. But a lot of us, you know, we're not going to say we're using revelation of God. We're just saying it makes sense to me logically that if there is a God, that this God would would for some logical reason that you're kind of arguing through some set of, 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 uh, of principles or some set of beliefs you hold that, that it only makes sense to you that if there was a God, he would value X or desire X. So, so it's not that, that people necessarily arrive there because they think they've been, this has been revealed to them supernaturally, but they've kind of just thought reasonably. In their minds, they think, I've thought reasonably about this, and it seems reasonable to me that if there's a God, he would behave in a certain way. Now, I grant you that we might argue, well, yeah, but how could you as a mere human really know enough? We're so different than God that it, it, I don't think we can, we can say we would know reasonably what God would do. But what I want to do in this uh, occasion is just to, to use another analogy. Now, we've talked about this before in other episodes where the power of analogies, the power of using a parable, a metaphor, Jesus clearly knew that power was there because he often used parables to explain otherwise difficult and complex theological issues, right? I mean, Jesus constantly did this, and he made those concepts available to us, accessible to us. And even then, there were clearly times when even his disciples were going like, what in the world is he talking about? I don't get it. So, so I think that we have to kind of unpack are metaphors for people as well. But the power of storytelling, the power of metaphors, I think will help us when we're trying to answer this question about sincerity. So let's try that now. And instead of arguing that, hey, if you're talking about like, like you know the mind of God, you'd have to know it from Scripture. Okay, some people are never going to go that way with you. So let's do it kind of through a reasoning process. Uh, what is reasonable based on a metaphor we can draw? So let's do that now. Here's my second response. It's on the screen for you. Okay, imagine that you and I, you know, we're, we're hiking, and as we're hiking, we discover a poisonous plant. It's hemlock, okay? Now, if you've ever seen hemlock, it looks like parsley. And because it looks like parsley, you might decide, hey, I like parsley, I'm gonna eat some of that. You sincerely believe that that plant that you're about to eat is parsley, but it's actually hemlock. Now, let me ask you a question. 
Do you think that your sincerity, the fact that you sincerely believe this is just parsley, is going to protect you from being poisoned, protect you from harm? What if you were traveling to meet your distant uncle, let's say, and you're traveling to meet your uncle and you've, and you've never been to his house before, it's your first time going there, and after taking a wrong turn, uh, you find yourself on the wrong street and you arrive at a house that has the same address, the same numbers, right, that your uncle's house has. He has the same exact numbers on his house, but now you're on the wrong street, but you're at the right numbers on the wrong street. If you sincerely believe that you're at the right house, I mean, you're convinced, you're sincere that, that you're on the right street and at the right numbers, even though you're not. And, and then you walk up to the front door and knock on it and a guy opens the front door. Do you think your sincerity will make this guy your uncle? I don't think it will, will it? I mean, most of us understand that the value of truth is different than sincerity. Um, both are important, don't get me wrong, but sincerity without truth can lead you to the wrong place and it could endanger your life. Would you like to sincerely know the truth? Okay. Again, I think sometimes, and I've done a couple of these now with you on these quick shot episodes we've done, I think a couple of these really um, scream for analogy and metaphor because the power of storytelling and this is like this uh, can quickly put this issue in its place, put this issue of sincerity in its place. You can see from this quick analogy that sincerity does not matter as much as truth. And if the house door you're trying to knock on to get in is not your uncle's but is instead God's, then your sincerity is not necessarily going to put you in the right house. And you could be knocking on that door and you sincerely believe that you're going to be in the right place. But it turns out truth about how you got there. And Jesus says that no one comes to the Father except through me. That claim has to be figured out. Is that true? Because if that's true, I don't care how sincere you are, Jesus is telling you, unless you believe this, this claim about truth, you're standing at the wrong door. It might even look similar. It might even have similar numbers, but you're on the wrong street. The metaphor helps us, I think, um, cross the bridge with people and help them to see why sincerity is not as important as truth. All right, I've given you two ways to kind of work through that response related to this claim that all God cares about is sincerity. And I hope that'll help you to overcome the objection, keep conversations going, and eventually be able to present the gospel to somebody you care about. We'll return next week and do more of this right here at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels and the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity, God's Crime Scene, Forensic Faith, and Alive.